I grew up in a family of, I was the last one my, when my mother reached perfection. She said, it'll stop right there. <laughs> <clears throat> but I remember her, even with her own children, confusing us. Every time she wanted to call me, she would say, Pepe, uh, no, I'm sorry, Leo, Pedro, Talo, and I would be the last one in the list. Tonight we're going to be reaching the point, let me get my glasses here. We're all forgetting things this afternoon. Please open your Bibles to Colossians chapter 4. <clears throat> the title of this message this afternoon is, We're All in This Together. Chapter 4, let's read verses 7 all the way to the end, verse 18. We're not going to be covering all this passage. I plan to terminate this um, series in Colossians next week. And so there will be two parts. We start reading verse 7. <clears throat> All my state shall Tychicus declare unto you, who is the beloved brother and a faithful minister and fellow servant in the Lord, whom I have sent unto you for the same purpose, that he might know your state and comfort your hearts. With Onesimus, a faithful and beloved brother, who is one of you, they shall make known unto you all things which are done here. Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, saluted you, and Marcus, sister's son to Barnabas, touching whom ye receive commandments, if he come unto you, receive him. And Jesus, who is called Justus, who are the circumcision, these only are my fellow workers, unto the kingdom of God, which have been a comfort unto me. Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ, saluted you, always laboring fervently for you in prayer, that you may, may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. For I bear him record that he had a great seal for you, and them that are in Laodicea, and them in Hierapolis. Luke, the beloved physician, and Demas greet you. Salute the brethren which are at Laodicea and uh, Nymphas, and the church which is in his house. And when this epistle is read among you, cause that it be read also in the church of Laodicea, and uh, that you likewise read the epistle of Laodicea. And say to Archippus, take heed to the ministry which thou hast received in the Lord, that thou, will, that thou fulfill it. The salutation by the hand of Paul, me, Paul, remember my bonds. Grace be unto you. Amen. Let's pray. Father, it's always amazing to me when we read Paul's epistles, each one that he writes, and they're masterpieces in theology. They reveal so many truths to us about Jesus Christ, the Father and the Holy Spirit. They explain what we, the position that we have in Christ as a church. We see the tremendous work that Paul did in his time. But when we come to his epistle, at the end of his epistles, we see that he stops and tries to catch our attention by naming certain individuals that stood beside him. And tonight we reach that portion of this epistle where Paul, as his manner is in the other epistles, kind of makes a, a stop and tries to have us understand that without these individuals, his ministry would probably, <clears throat> probably would not have been as effective. And so, Lord, <clears throat> I pray that we will be able to glean a message here for us this, this afternoon. The title, Lord, I think reveals very clear where we're going with this. It's not about one or two who do the work. It's about the whole body. We're all in this together. And this is why I think at the end of every epistle, Paul takes the time to mention the names of those who stood beside him. 
We never think of Paul going through depression, going through bad moments, moments of discouragement. But as we see his companions, how they comforted him, how they strengthened him, how they served him, we see that Paul was very human and could have gone through the same infirmities as we do. But thanks to you, Lord, he had men and women who stayed. Men who were willing to stay all the way through, even risk their own lives, their own necks, as Paul very clearly puts it in his writings, for his sake, for his health, for his life. So Lord, as we go into this last section, I pray that you will help us see ourselves in this picture also. The, the, the story hasn't finished. The story for Paul, yes. The story for these men that we just read about, yes. But the story continues. There's another story being written today with our lives. And if we had an epistle with our names, I, I wonder how we would look, how we would be described. So Lord, tonight I pray that as we look into the lives of these men, that we will also compare ours and see where we stand at this moment. Give me the ability, Lord. Give me the strength of the Holy Spirit, this, the freedom that the Spirit gives, Lord, to preach this message. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. As we come to this last section, we see that Paul was not only a soul winner, he was also a great friend maker. <clears throat> As I mentioned before, I don't know how you are with, main, with names. I'm not good with names. I'm good with faces. I can remember a face for years. I can remember details about the person just as soon as I see their face. But names, especially names as the ones we see here, are very difficult to memorize. But I see that Paul didn't have a problem with that. I'm impressed to see that although he was a very prominent figure, a tremendous missionary, a very well-known uh, apostle uh, in his time, he showed interest, he showed concern to those who were probably would not be considered important in the eyes of the world. If you, compare, if you compare the epistles of Paul, you'll see that he does this all the time. He ends an epistle, probably the, the, in this one, chapter 4, we've been going through discipline, you know, doctrine, very good emphasis on how, you know, the dangers that we go through. He tells us how to live a successful life, how to put Christ, uh, give Christ the preeminence that he deserves. Everything here is very useful, but then he, it kind of cuts clean. He does what we see in a good movie. I, I don't know if you see good movies or not. I, it's very hard to find a good movie, but when you find a good movie and it gives you that taste, like, wow, I enjoyed that. But what happens when you see the end? The end. And then you start seeing all the credits. Who stays behind to read all the names? Can I see your hand? You guys are crazy. <laughs> I had to ask that. <laughs> you know, when I read, uh, when I did uh, the, the letter of Romans, remember that time when we went through the book? Again, I underestimated the, the epistle. I thought, 16 chapters, 51 uh, Sundays in the year, I can do this in one year. We were into the book two and a half years, and we only reached chapter 13. And I was hoping to get into chapter 16, basically because Paul does a clean cut on chapter 15. He does a tremendous uh, uh, job. Of course, he's being inspired by the Holy Spirit, but he does a tremendous job giving us all the, what we call the La Carta Magna, the constitution of Christianity, a tremendous uh, epistle that gives us the doctrinal instructions on salvation. Every chapter, it, was very, it wasn't hard to outline every chapter. Every, every chapter was a joy to be able to study and then be able to organize it. But my surprise came when I got to chapter 16. What do you find when you get to chapter 16? 35 names, well, actually in the whole book, but a total of 35 names that you probably never heard about before. And Paul takes the time to mention each one in detail. 
I can imagine, I do a lot of imagination when I read my Bible, but uh, I can imagine Paul going through the, all those 15 chapters and finally reaching chapter 16, kind of breathes in and says, okay, puts a big smile on his face and say, let me tell you who was the one, who are the people that stood behind me that made this possible. And he takes the time and I think he savors each one of those names by saying, oh, what my ministry would have been without if I hadn't had this individual. If I didn't have this woman uh, standing beside the, the, the team, helping us in every, uh, every area, providing for our physical needs, and giving us encouragement when we were going through bad moments. He takes the time to mention those names. And, you know, when I got to that chapter, I thought, you know, I think we could all skip it. It's like when you read the book of Numbers. How many of you get excited reading the book of Numbers? Only Tim gets excited reading the book of Numbers. You find the typical thing, and, uh, you know, uh, and these are the names of the men that are da 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 the tribe of Reuben, Eliasur, the son of Sedeor, of Simon, Nashon, the son of Aminadab, and Issachar. And you go through all these names, 50, five minutes after you into the book, you go, uh, I kind of, uh, maybe I'll, I'll skip the book. You get, you get uh, sleepy. They, these names don't mean anything to you. But when you, when you study the names in, in the epistle, or in these epistles, and you see what's behind the scenes, the drama uh, of these men's lives and how they worked side by side with the Apostle Paul, it is tremendously exciting. Sometimes... Even as I think about it now, I get emotional. <clears throat> in chapter 16 in Romans, yes, he mentions so many names. Don't ever feel like sapping over to 1 Corinthians when you get to chapter 16 of Romans. Or when you get to Colossians chapter 4 and start seeing these names. You know, I can move on to 1 Thessalonians. I've, I don't think there's anything there for me now. It's kind of like when you see that good movie I mentioned before and you see the credits kind of passing on. You think, you know, that the, the star of that movie was so amazing. And, and you know, all the other actors, just, they did a tremendous job to make this a success. You see all those other names, the carpenters, the, 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 the stunt men, the, uh, you know, all these individuals that just roll in the, in the screen at the end of the movie. You feel like... Who are they? they? They're only mentioned for a second. But did you know that movie would not be able to be produced without those people? It were those people that made the actors look good. When I think about that, I realize that Paul, although he was a great man of God, he was also a man who knew how to work in, 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 as a team. He was a team worker. And here, when you get to Colossians, you find that he does it again. He mentions 11 names. He sent personal greetings to Colossa for six of his associates in the ministry. Aristarchus, John Mark, Jesus, also named Justus. That was the Roman name. These were all Jews. And then several names that appear. They were all Gentiles. Epaphras, Luke, Demas. And Paul added special greetings to two church assemblies, which are uh, with a special word of one of the pastors, which was Archipo. And does this, giving us, giving, us, giving us an idea of who was really involved and who advanced him in his ministry. Now, it was hard for me to kind of li uh, outline this, and then I saw it. Three points. You have to have three points in every message, right? That's the only way you can have it. Not really, but you see, I outlined the first, the men who stayed. This is what we're going to be concentrated on tonight. Those who stick with you, no matter what the situation is. Those who stayed, then the men who prayed. We see a man who prayed fervently, Epaphras. But then we see a name there, Demas, the man who strayed later on. As we look at the men who stayed, we have, we have to look into chapter 4, verse 10 and 11. I want you 
to notice who these people were. Aristarchus, my beloved prisoner, I'm sorry, my fellow prisoner, saluted you and Marcus, sister son of Barnabas, touching whom you receive commandments. If he come unto you, receive him. And verse 11, and Jesus, who is called Jestus, who are of the circumcision that were Jews, these only are my fellow workers unto the kingdom of God, which have been a comfort unto me. Look at verse 14 now. Luke, my beloved physician, and Demas greet you. We first uh, come to the men who stayed. Three Jews, Aristarchus, John Mark, and Justus, and one Gentile, Luke. All of them were characterized by faithfulness to the Apostle Paul in his hour of special need. They were faithful co-workers and comforters. Now today when you, in the 21st century church, sometimes what you see is people kind of think that, you know, the workers, the, the ones that have to be really faithful are the pastors and the missionaries, maybe the, the teachers, but really, you know, who is to be faithful? All of us. All of us are to be co-workers, faithful co-workers. And if we're not being comforted, we have to be comforters to others. And these are the ones who stayed. Let me speak to you first about, about Aristarchus. In verse 10, you see his, this weird name. By the way, if you ever have kids or grandkids, this is a good list to go and get your names for the kids. Imagine calling your grandson, hey, Aristarchus, come over here. I don't think that would be a good idea. We see him mentioned in chapter 4, verse 10. And, he, and, he, and he, when he mentions his name, it's kind of like Paul is savoring this and saying, you need to know about this guy. Although he's only mentioned a few times in the Bible, this individual risked his neck for me, Paul. Yeah. And he calls him a fellow prisoner. But hold on a second, he wasn't arrested with Paul, but he's there in prison with Paul. This man was identified as Paul's fellow prisoner and fellow worker. If you move over to verse 11, it says, These only are my fellow workers into the kingdom of God, which has been, uh, been a comfort to me. Now, who is this man? Who is this Aristarchus? Who are these individuals that Paul mentions here? Well, fortunately, we can do a character study. Have you ever done a character study? I mean, it's easy to study the, the life of the Apostle Paul. It's easy to study the life of the Apostle Peter and all those great men. There's a lot of you know, information about them, but very, very little information about the names that we are going to be studying tonight. But for Paul, if you hadn't come up here tonight and say, Paul, tell us about some important guys who you admire and who you appreciate, who stood with you and who would not have been, you know, you, you would not have been able to do your ministry without them beside you. He would have said, let me mention one of them tonight, Aristarchus. And you would have said, who's that guy? Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner. Aristarchus was from Macedonia and was one of Paul's traveling companions. Now, if you travel with Paul, it wasn't like take the, the uh, narrow plane to the Caribbean and then from there go to some other wonderful, uh, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, beautiful island. It was, you, you, you knew you were in for trouble. I remember years ago, probably John was here then, uh, a missionary from Germany uh, invited the church to do a field trip, a mission, mission trip. And uh, they did this every year. And when he mentioned, uh, how about going to Romania? Any volunteers? Maybe one hand. They said, oh boy, I think that's not going to work. And they had heard so much about Romania, how difficult life was there. And then it kind of dawned on him. He said, hey, how about Brother Perez over there in La Costa del Sol? 21 of them came. And you thought, oh, they really want to suffer for Christ, don't they? They came, and they, of course, they loved the place. And it was hard for me as a pastor to show them that La Costa del Sol is more than just the sun and the beautiful Mediterranean Sea. There was people out there that were hurting we had a chance to have them meet some of them. But the first thing you think is, 
I want to go to a place where I don't have to go, uh, you know, have, a, have to go through a hard time. Well, if you ask uh, somebody like Aristarchus, he said, give me the hardest place you can imagine. The hardest place you can think of. In Acts chapter 19, verse 20 and 20, uh, 29 to 30, he says, And the whole city was filled with confusion, and having caught Gaius and Aristarchus, men of Macedonia, that's where we know that he was from Macedonia, Paul's companions in travel, they rushed with one accord into the theater. And when Paul would have entered into the people, the disciples suffered him not. He said, I want to go in with you. And the disciple says, no, Paul, you, you, uh, no, you, you, you can't do this. Now, if you th look, about, uh, look at that theater, I happened, when I went to Turkey a few, uh, week, a few months ago, I think it is already, I happened to go into that theater. And you know me, I'm a romantic. I stood in that theater, it's about 300 meters down from the, from the hill into the Eph Ephesus, and about three or 400 meters into, from the bottom, up into Ephesus. There's an amphitheater, and there's another small theater, and when I got up there, I read this passage and I said, Paul, where are you? He wasn't there. He had really left. But I thought about this and I thought, Paul, I wonder how it would have been 2,000 years ago when you were threatened, your lives were threatened. I closed my eyes and I tried to imagine the sounds, the screams, the threats, and even the smells. Today, if you go there, you probably have a, an orchestra playing a beautiful symphony. When I got there, they, there was one doing the rehearsal. It didn't feel like what Paul had gone through. But I could imagine Paul being there saying, well, you know, I'm ready to risk my life. It doesn't matter what, what it takes. I'm ready to uh, risk everything for the cause of the gospel. And there you have Aristarchus standing right beside him. Now this man, Aristarchus, was originally from Thessalonica. In Acts chapter 20, verse 4, it says, And there accompanied him into Asia, Sopater of Berea, and of the Thessalonians, Aristarchus and Secundus, that's a good name to give your kids, and Gaius of Derbe and Timothy, Demotheos of Asia, Tychicus and Trophimus. Trophimus. <laughs> Aristarchus willingly risked his life in that efficient plot. Again, as, as I was rehearsing this in my mind, by the way, I also had the chance to go to this, uh, um, uh, the, uh, what's the name? It's a very hard name. He mentions it here. Um, Hediapolis. Thank you very much, Tim. I stood there. All, all, you know, when I was, I was going through this epistle, looking at these places, then being there made it so much more special. But of course, I was following a tour guide. It wasn't the same. The sounds were not the same. The danger wasn't the same. The situation was completely different. I did take a picture with a, uh, with a gladiator uh, wanting to stab me with a sword, but that sword was made of plastic. Today, nothing that you see there seems to be very real. But for Paul and his companions, all this was very real. Aristarchus, my friends, that was the type of individual who, who no matter what happens, what circumstances you're going with, he stayed. He stayed in the right of Ephesus, on the long voyage to Rome, going through a storm. Even in prison, Paul said, although I'm not arrested, I'm going to stay here with you. That's why he calls him in chapter 4, verse, verse 10, Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner. He's over here too. Say, hey, say, guys, say hi to the guys over there. Uh, you want to go with him? No, I'm, gonna, I'm staying right here with you, Paul. Fellow prisoner probably means that Aristarchus shared Paul's confinement with, <clears throat> with him so that he could be helped, so that he could be comforted as an, uh, an apostle. He was a voluntary prisoner for the sake of Jesus Christ and the gospel. I've learned to appreciate this individual. You know, when I get to heaven, I'm going to be calling, looking out for some people. One of them is Epaphras. Hey, Epaphras, come over here. I want to salute you, my brother. You have inspired me tremendously. Hey, Archippus, where's Archippus? Or Aristarchus, where are you? 
Um, how do you know my name? Well, it's only mentioned a couple of times in the Bible, but brother, you were there when the rough things started going on. He was one of Paul's greatest helpers. <clears throat> if you asked them, well, asked him to go with you in the trip, he would not be looking for the easy tasks or the clean things to do. He would be looking for the dirty jobs. He labored for Paul. Then we come to John Mark. We find him there in chapter 4, verse 10. Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, saluted you, and Mark, Marcus, sister son of Barnabas. Now, I think we treat uh, Mark kind of unfair. If you ask anybody, you know who John Mark was? Yeah, he was the one that betrayed Paul in his first missionary journey. And we kind of leave it there. But I would think that would be very unfair because he did so much more than just betray Paul in one journey, one trip. Who was John Mark? Don't be too fast in judging him. Yes, he was kind of green uh, on his first missionary journey, but remember he was with Jesus Christ for three years. And you see now Barnabas saying, hey, my, uh, Paul, we're going on a missionary journey. Why don't we take Mark? I think it would be a good idea. He would get some experience. Paul said, all right, you're the boss. You're, you're in charge. You're the one leading. Later on, it was Paul and Barnabas. Now it's, but now it's Barnabas and Paul. And Mark goes along. And Paul has a very bitter experience with this young man who he thought would probably be, be of some help. In, in the way there, in his journey, he, but Paul and Mark uh, turned around and said, I want to go home. I can't take this. You know what? You don't have to go back 2,000 years to see this kind of a, uh, reaction. You know, when you get into the mission field today, many missionaries go to the mission field thinking it's going to be an adventure. I remember my mentor, Dr. J.T. Lyons, he spent about 10 years in Liberia, in Africa, in a very, very difficult place. He said, oh, I saw missionaries come and go. They came with a very romantic idea about Africa when they saw the real Africa, that there's real snakes and real animals want to eat you up. And there's all kinds of diseases, malaria, yellow fever, da da da, da. you know, it, it, everything seems to want to go for you. So when you see that, a lot of missionaries think, well, you know what? Maybe this is not my God's will for me. But it seemed like it was God's will when they started raising support and they went through the churches. And they said, you know, we're going there because God has called us. Five, five six weeks into the mission field, they would feel that that was probably a mistake. You see this often. Sometimes we have a very romantic idea of the ministry. But J.T. Lyons told me, Sammy, he said, Sammy, if you're going to go to the mission field, you need to have clear ideas because if you don't have them clear, you're not going to make it. He had been in the ministry for over 30 years at that time. He's with the Lord today. He says, many missionaries go because Mama and Papa want them to go. It makes them feel very important. They go to the mission field because they have a kind of a romantic idea of the mission field. Some people tell them, you know what, if you follow these, uh, these uh, um, tactics in uh, five years, you'll probably have a church of 300. Then you can move on and start another church. And then 10 years, you can have a five or six churches all established in the same area. And then you can come home and be considered a successful missionary. Well, five years into the ministry, they didn't even have one convert. It's time to go home. I remember the story of Hudson Taylor into his experience in China. For seven years, not one convert. Many, many of his uh, team missionaries had left back, went back to England, but he stayed. And he stood with it. And he left one of the greatest missionary um, missions that we know in our recent uh, hi history. But he had to learn, he had to learn that, you know, when you go to the field, it's all about Christ and very little about you. If you don't do it that way, you're not going to make it. JT would say, Sammy, if you don't have your, uh, your calling very clear, halfway into the, into the job, into the mission work, you probably start wondering, am I really called? Because this is not what I expected. You need to have things clear, otherwise you're not going to make it. I've been in the ministry now for 26 years. 
And sometimes I feel like quitting. It's very difficult. When you get to the mission field, you don't have a band of people just, you know, cheering up, saying, welcome. After six months into the field, you might have people that want you to leave. I don't know. You have all kinds of different experiences. But we see here a situation with John Mark. He was too green. He was too immature for that trip. And very soon into this very difficult first mission trip, Mark said, I, wanna, I want mommy. I want to go home. In Acts uh, chapter 12, verse 12, it says, And when he had considered the thing, he came to the house of Mary. Uh, I'm sorry. Where am I here? Um, I'm sorry, we, we see him in Mark chapter 4, uh, Colossians chapter 4, verse 10. Uh, and Mark, his sister's son, to Barnabas. Then we see that Mark had, uh, you know, some very interesting individuals behind him also in Acts chapter 12. Verse 12, it says, And when he had considered the thing, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark, where many were gathered together praying. This Mark praying with all of those trying to get uh, Peter out of, out of prison. And it's quite possibly, possi there's a poss good possibility that John Mark was led to the faith by the Apostle Peter. You find in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 13, a very interesting detail. He says, The church that is in Babylon, elected together with you, saluted you, and so doth Marcus, my son. That's interesting. Paul called um, Timothy his son. And here we see Peter calling Marcus, my son. Uh, you know, it kind of gives you the idea that maybe it was Peter the one that led Marcus to the Lord. But on that first missionary journey, Mark abandoned him. Abandoned Paul. Acts chapter 13, 5 and 13 says, And when they were at Salome, they preached the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews, and they had also John to minister. Now when Paul and his company loosed from Paphos, they came to Perga in Pamphylia, and John, departing from them, returned to Jerusalem. Why? Do we know why Mark decided, hey, you know what, I'm... I'm gone. Well, maybe he was afraid of the, to move into dangerous territory. I can understand that. When Brother Timothy has to go to uh, Togo, and uh, you see some of the areas there, I don't know if he would dare to go on, out there on his own. It's probably not safe to go on your own. If you go to some places in Nigeria, Brother uh, um, Samson, you probably... Don't want to be, go there on your own. Well, Mark said, you know, this is just too complicated for me. This is not what I expected. Maybe it was the danger in that territory. Maybe he resented the fact that Paul was taking over the leadership of the mission and replacing Barnabas. Now, he's the boss. Or maybe John Mark resented Paul's ministry to the Gentiles. A Jew to the Gentiles? Uh. Now, whatever reason it was, whatever excuse you could find, I think he left. He simply just decided, you know, this is just too much for me. I can't take this. So when we think of that, that, that turning back, you think of a mark and you say, oh, yeah, he's a loser. He's a loser. He's, he's one, of those that, one of those kind of guys that you don't want to be. But, you know, uh, He wrote an epistle. He wrote one of the Gospels. And uh, many things would not have happened if Mark had not come back into the scene and take responsibility. In fact, Paul picked up on this later on, years later. Remember, he came back to Jerusalem, gave report with Barnabas. Now Barnabas says, so okay, okay, uh, Paul, uh, you know, Mark betrayed us, but... Uh, he turned his back on us, but now maybe he's grown up. Maybe, maybe he can come with us on this trip. And Paul said, you what? We're not taking that. I'm not taking Mark with me. You don't understand how severe, how difficult this situation is. We don't want to be into difficult territory and have him go back home and discourage the whole team. We, 
No way, Jose. In fact, here's how the, this, the Bible describes that event, this, this contention that was so sharp between Paul and Barnabas. In Acts chapter 15, verse 36 through 41, it says, And uh, some days after, Paul said unto Barnabas, Let us go again and visit our brethren in every city where we have preached the word of, God, of, the, word of the Lord and see how they do. And Barnabas detained to take with them John, whose surname was Mark, but Paul thought not good to take him with them, who departed from them from Pamphylia and went not with them to the work. And the contention was so sharp between them that they departed asunder one from the other. And so Barnabas took Mark and sailed to Cy Cyprus, and Paul chose Silas and departed, being recommended by the brethren unto the grace of God. And he went through Syria and Cilicia, confirming the churches. Now you say, was Paul wrong in his assessment with this young man? Perhaps, but we cannot blame Paul. Sometimes you think about this, you say, Paul, why do you be so strict? Listen, Paul, in these missionary journeys that he did, was more like a trailblazer. He was opening uh, uh, uncharted territory, risking his life in every, uh, at every turn. And he, the, the last thing he needed was a, a young man who would be like, oh, where's the mall? Where can I do, when, I, when can I get some uh, souvenirs? You know, some, maybe you don't know about this, but some, we've, I've had churches in the States saying, hey, we want to send a, a, a team of uh, teenagers on the mission trip to Spain. Can you host them? I said, what age are they? They're 15 years old. I said, no, thank you. I, I did that one time. I'm not saying you shouldn't, but, you know, I, I kind of, I don't, I, I just don't like to babysit. And uh, the idea that some of these young men have are very strange. They, they get on the plane, and the first thing they do, oh, we're doing a mission trip to Spain. And they get on the plane, oh, this seat is too narrow. And this food is just not warm enough. And they get out of the plane, and they get on, a, on the road, and they say, oh, there's a strange smell in this, in this place. And people dress so funny here. They don't even speak American. You, know, you kind of get all kinds of reactions. They're so green behind the ears, it's just, just not funny. And the first thing they want to do as soon as they, they arrive is have a, like a five-star hotel room. Some of them do. The food, strange food. People are strange. They look different. They dress different. They feel like, you know, they want to push back and they say, well, maybe it wasn't a good idea to come to this mission. <clears throat> I don't know how, Paul, uh, how Bar uh, Mark was, but whatever it was that made him turn around, it was, it was something that he had to deal with. I remember as I was writing these notes, I have only 15 minutes, we have a meeting right after that. I remember when God, Gabriel, he was in college for three years, and at that time, the college back in the States, uh, it was in Puerto Rico, they said, you know, we are promoting all our students, if they can, during the, the holiday break, the three month summer break, to go to some kind of mission field and do some practices. And Gabi, of course, he, was, uh, he said, Dad, what do you think? I said, I think that's a good idea. Well, how are you gonna do this? He said, well, first of all, the, the, the school director doesn't uh, seem to want to support me. So I don't need really his support. I want your, uh, your input. And I said, son, you feel prepared? He said, I think so, Dad. They said, where are you going? He says, to Panama, to the Kuna Indians. Knowing Gabi, that was going to paradise. You know, Gabi's a wild kid. He loves adventure. To mingle, to live with the Indians for three months, it would be like heaven for him. So there was a missionary who came and picked up a, a group of students went to Panama, got him on a, a pickup truck, drove like four or five hours into the jungle, and then started leaving them every hour in one tribe. And here Gabi uh, gets to this tribe, and um, a few days later he calls me, he manages to get a phone, and he said, Dad, I've arrived. I said, how does the look, place look like? He said, well, I, I, you know, I, I wasn't noticed. 
And uh, I said, well, how's your lodging place? They said, well, they showed me this hut and I have a hammock to sleep on, dirt floor. And they showed me, well, we're gonna have a dinner. It was a, a dog or something that was moving there in the bush. He says, great. <laughs> said, well, that's great, okay. A few weeks later, he said, Dad, I brought you know, really nice, clean white shirts. They're not white anymore. I said, don't they have a washing machine? They said, they don't have, we, we have to go up the river and wash it. Then the water in the river is brown. He stayed there for three months. He used a machete to call, cut the, the grass. And uh, most of the time he was hunting for his food. And you think, you know, I would not have made it there. Three months later, he lost about 10 kilos. When I talked to him back again in Puerto Rico, I said, how did it go? He said, Dad, I want to go back. I said, you're crazy, kid. Uh, you know what you're talking about. He said, Dad, these people were so hungry for the word. And they gave me chances to preach the, the, the Bible and teach the Bible three, four, five hours a day. It was wonderful. And you know me. I like survival environments, and when, you are, when you're there with the Kunya Indians, that's practically what you have every day. I know I wouldn't have made it. And I think the Lord has people, different people for different situations. But again, Paul Mark, in this first trip, did not make it through. Did Paul ever forgive Mark for what he did? He sure did. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, 11, it says, Only Luke is with me. Take Mark and bring him with thee, for he is profitable to me for the ministry. You know, Mark, Tit, Titus, and Timothy were young men who served as special representatives for the Apostle Paul. And we have Paul, uh, Mark here now, uh, Paul saying, he's useful. You know, I get a lot of encouragement from studying the life of Mark because if Mark got a second chance, that means I can get a second chance. If I failed before, it doesn't mean I have to stay failed. I can get up, improve uh, in whatever area I need to improve and get back on my feet and try again. Paul, I mean, and Mark didn't just sit around and sulk. He got back into the ministry and proved himself faithful to the Lord and to the Apostle Paul. It took a while, but later he was one of the men who stayed, as we see in Colossians chapter 4. And there's one more individual I'd like to mention. Jesus called Justus. And Jesus, which is called Justus or just who are of the circumcision, they were Jew. These only are my fellow workers unto the kingdom of God, which have been a comfort to me. These guys are the guys that, the type of people that stay. No matter how, how hard the situation is, they stay, they stick with it. They might, might have a difficult time adapting to situations. But they, they're the type of individual who say, you know, we're not here for the, for the joy ride. We're here for whatever. If it means putting a life for the cause of Jesus Christ, we are willing to put it down. Justus represents those faithful believers who serve God, but whose deeds are not announced. Just the name appears on the screen at the end of the movie, and then it disappears. I have so much more to say about him because then we, we, he mentions Luke, my beloved physician, always with Paul, risk this life. I need to shut this, close this, and I don't know where to because I got so much information. So I'm going to see if I can wrap it up by taking you to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Come with me to Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 3. By now you're probably, I don't know how you feel, but maybe you say, well, I thought you were going to preach something interesting. I find this to be very interesting. If I had another half an hour, I'd probably show you more details about these men who are so inspiring. But you say, what does this have to do with me? Well, I want to show you what this has to do with you because the story, listen, please listen. If you want to call it a movie, 
hasn't finished. It goes on. Now, your names might not be recorded in the Bible, but I tell you one thing, the Lord is taking note. If Paul wrote these names, thank you, Paul, but remember, he's inspired by the Holy Spirit, which means that God is taking note. Do you pick that up? It is, God is taking note of what they did, and God is taking note of what we do today. If we were writing a new script, a new story, with us inside mentioning each one of our names, would we be counted as the ones who stayed? Or maybe as the ones who prayed, stood be, stayed behind, but prayed fervently? Or the ones that just kind of sat around? Look with me at 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 5. 1 Corinthians 3. It says, And who then is Paul, and who is Apollos, but ministers by whom you believed, even as the Lord gave to every man? I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then neither is he that planted anything, neither he that watered, but God that giveth the increase. Now, pay attention. Now he that planted and he that watered are one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. You will not be getting the reward for something that somebody else did. I won't be getting the reward for something somebody else did. But as Paul says that in every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are laborers together with God. You are God's husbandry. You are God's building according to the grace of God which is given unto me as a wise master builder. I have laid the foundation and another builder thereon. But pay attention. Please pay attention. This is speaking to you. And this is speaking to me. But let every man take heed how he built it thereupon. There's only one foundation, that's Jesus Christ. But we're all called to build. How many of you knew that? I discharged called my fellow prisoner, Marcus, sister, son to Barnabas. Jesus, which is called Justus, a fellow worker. Luke, a beloved physician. All of these men injected their service in the life and ministry of the Apostle Paul and together glorify the Lord tremendously. 2,000 years have gone by. We're now in the story. When we come before the judgment seat of Christ, which is part of what we read in this chapter in 1 Corinthians 3, what will be said of us? What will be said of you? Will we, we be the ones listed with those who stayed no matter what and worked hard, not looking for honor or self-recognition, not looking for comfort zone in the church, but one those who say, you know what, I know this is going to be hard, but I want to be there. I want to be part of the team. I want to work for the Lord. What do I need to do? You want me to scrub some toilets? I'm, I'm ready to do that. You want me to push chairs around? I'm willing to do that. You want me to take care of the food? Whatever arrangement we need to, well, I'm, I'm ready to do that. Because I'm not looking for recognition. I'm, I'm, I'm looking to make this body work uh, effectively. I'm, whatever it is you want me to do, Lord, I'm ready to do it. If, it. if it means washing feet. Well, maybe not that. You know, I, I don't know about you, but... I, I get emotional about this because I wonder how my story is going to look like when I come before the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the master builder. I mean, Jesus Christ is the foundation. <clears throat> Paul is a wise master builder. But there's work to do. Do you see this mural over here? I, I built that years ago. I was inspired to do that as I was reading the book of Ephesians. And I saw so many symbols there, so many different ingredients. Two pillars, faith and love. The faith, the, the body of doctrine that we need to, that, uh, that um, identifies as Christians. We need 
a strong foundation, doctrinal foundation. We, and the glue that puts all that together is the love, that agape love, the sacrificial love. But then you see little stones all kind of carved in the same shape. You know who they are? That's you and me. All laid up, building up a, a temple. And in the center of all that, the Lord Jesus Christ, is this, the work that his sacrifice on the cross that makes everything meaningful. Every time I look at that, I said, yeah, I, okay, that's, we need to aim to that. Some are still being built. They're being formed. They're being conformed to the image of Christ. But all, we're all part of the building. Some of us are at the bottom of the construction. Some of others are at the top. But all of us must be going through some kind of discipleship, some formation, sticking together to do God's work. Listen, don't just conform to come to church, listen to a message, then pray and go. That's, that's, that's not what it's about. We're called to be workers for the Lord. We're called to be collaborators in whatever area we need to Work, we need to be there. We need to stand together. We're all in this together. The reason why Paul brings these names, I believe, is because he's, he's, he wants to give us an, uh, an understanding of how church is, is done. It's not about one or two. It's about all of us taking together for the glory of the Lord, doing whatever we have to do, doing it unselfishly, doing it generously, doing it willingly. And if, if it requires that we do dirty jobs, well, let it be. Let's do, that. Let's do that also for the glory of the Lord. There's a message here for us. Today we only covered those who stayed. But remember, there's another one there who's doing the praying, Epaphras. We're going to look into his testimony next week. Let's all stand and have a word of prayer. <clears throat> Father, I, due to time, I could uh, bring all the details about these other men who were so influential in Paul's life. Some risk their necks for him. And he takes the time to mention it. Some of them were um, families, uh, couples who took him in in cold nights when he didn't have any lodging. We see this name, Gaius, see him two, three times. We think, well, who's he? He probably didn't have talent to preach, but he seemed like he had a, a great house, a great lodging place, and every chance that he had to bring in and give lodging, give a sheltered Lord to uh, 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 laborers uh, for the kingdom, Lord, he was always opening his door for them to give them support. We see him again in 3 John. Just a couple of times these names show in the scriptures. But Lord, these men were so important, so influential. Today they're all in heaven with you. Today they're all with Paul in heaven. I wonder what's going on there today. I wonder if they can see clearer than ever what it was all about. But we're still here. And I pray, Lord, that you'll help us understand what the mission of the church is about and what part we need to have in it. I pray, Lord, that you will speak to our hearts with these last words that Paul gives us in Colossians chapter 4. He's not just putting these names down. He's putting these names down with a purpose. That's a great lesson for us here. And I pray that you will teach that lesson to us, that we will understand the place that we need to have in this building. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.